The 13 British colonies in America had just recently succeeded in throwing off the rulership of the British king and parliament, freeing themselves from the burden of harsh taxation without representation and other indignities. By pooling their efforts and their weapons, they had waged a war with the most powerful nation in the world and prevailed. Leading up to that revolutionary war, they had forged a loose confederation under the leadership of an elected group of men dubbed the Continental Congress. The Congress had created a document titled the Articles of Confederation, which laid out the details of their cooperation. They had been sensible enough to realize that if each colony had attempted to resist British rule by itself, its efforts would have been crushed. They needed each other and the power that came from combining their efforts. Now that they had forced the British from their shores, the new question was how to move forward. Was the loose confederation enough to ensure a safe and prosperous future for the individual states? A significant proportion of the men who had been leaders in the war effort and in the Continental Congress did not think so. They began urging very early that the only way America as a country could take a solid place on the stage of world powers would be to establish a much stronger central federal government with the 13 former colonies, now 13 states, voluntarily giving up a certain amount of their authority over their own interests, trusting it to that central government. You might say that the United States at this stage was decidedly disunited and more pointedly a mess. After the Treaty of Paris formally ended the Revolutionary War in 1783, several states had proceeded blithely to violate the agreements it had laid out. As seen in this illustration, colonists who had been loyal to England during the Revolution were often harassed and even horribly physically abused by patriots. This continued after the end of the war. New York and South Carolina repeatedly prosecuted such people and confiscated and redistributed their lands, actions forbidden by the Paris Priest Treaty. The Articles of Confederation had specifically stated that individual states were not to negotiate directly with foreign authorities, raise armies, or make war but states were doing all these things. Individual state legislatures independently laid embargoes on goods shipped into their ports to the detriment of the commerce of other states. At a meeting of states in September 1786, James Madison angrily questioned whether the Articles of Confederation was a binding compact or even a viable government. Connecticut had not been paying any of its share of the expenses of the Confederation. In the South, the British were said to be openly funding Creek Indian raids on Georgia, and that state was under martial law. The Articles of Confederation provided absolutely no way to solve any of these kinds of problems. Those who were convinced that the only sensible way to move forward with national plans was to start from scratch and create a much stronger federal government were known as Federalists. Foremost among this group were Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison, who, under the group pseudonym of Publius, wrote a collection of 85 articles known as the Federalist Papers, commentary on the need for a new constitution. Those in another faction among the former leaders of the revolution were not convinced this was the best answer to the problems facing the new nation. Those who were seriously concerned about the possible misuse of power by a strong central government were called anti-federalists. They worried, among other things, that the position of president, then a novelty, might evolve into a monarchy. Well-known founding fathers who were anti-federalists included Patrick Henry, the Virginian who famously declared, give me liberty or give me death in 1775 when urging his fellow colonists to join the revolution. Samuel Adams was second cousin to his fellow founding father, later to become a U.S. president, John Adams. Sam was the Massachusetts hardliner who, as you may remember, responded to the Shays' Rebellion with the words, The man who dares to rebel against the laws of a republic ought to suffer death. You may remember Thomas Paine from your American high school history classes for writing a pamphlet you were likely required to read, titled Common Sense. It had encouraged the common people of the colonies to get on board with the American Revolution. It was sold and distributed widely and read aloud at taverns and meeting places. George Mason was one of the three Virginia delegates to the Con Constitutional Convention who refused to sign the Constitution. He had a major role in the writing of the Virginia Constitution and Virginia Bill of Rights, and he insisted that the new federal Constitution would not be acceptable without such a Bill of Rights. 
When the new Congress agreed to add such a Bill of Rights, much of its content and even wording was borrowed directly from Mason's writings. It is interesting and perhaps instructive to notice that in Mason's Virginian Bill of Rights, the well-regulated militia is mentioned as it was later in the Second Amendment. That a well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people trained to arms is the proper, natural, and safe defense of a free state. That standing armies in times of peace should be avoided as dangerous to liberty. And that in all cases the military should be under strict subordination to and governed by the civil power. Notice that there is no mention of individual bearing of arms at all, even though the men in his well-regulated militia would be trained to arms. And of course, there is nothing in the statement that has anything to do with private rights to gun ownership. Henry and Adams and Mason and the other anti-federalists were much less trusting than the federalists in the ability of the states to put up a resistance if such a central government someday ended up under the leadership of unscrupulous men who decided to turn toward tyranny. Then came Shays' Rebellion in Massachusetts in 1786. A large number of former Revolutionary War soldiers in the inland rural parts of the state became disgruntled over what they perceived as totally unfair taxation by the Massachusetts government. Massachusetts had been so careless about paying these men for their service in the war that many came back almost penniless. Pressure from the wealthy Boston merchant class for all debts to be paid in gold or silver created a situation in which these farmers were unable to even pay for the bare necessities of life. Add to this new, burdensome taxes levied by the state government in order to pay the state's war debts. It wasn't long before the government began foreclosing on farms, farmers, and their families were being evicted from their land, and some were even ending up in debtor's prison. Thus, a movement sprang up of rebels, eventually dubbed Shays Rebellion after one of its leaders, Daniel Shays. The rebellion challenged these burdens, its members ready to take up arms and fight for their land and livelihood. In spite of the fact that this was painfully, obviously similar to the reasons that Massachusetts itself had participated in the Revolutionary War, the state government, under the leadership of Governor James Bowden, was unwilling to negotiate some relief for those who were feeling so oppressed and instead took a hardline stance. Inconveniently for that government, many of the men in the Massachusetts state militia were sympathetic to the plight of the farmers and thus refused to be called up to form an army to put down the rebellion. Even members of state militias in nearby states were sympathetic to the rebels' cause, and thus Massachusetts couldn't seek help from its neighbors. Nor did it have enough finances to pay to hire a private army. Eventually, the merchants of Boston, among which was the wealthy governor of Massachusetts, James Bowden, pooled their resources and paid to hire a private army of 3,000 to do the job. Because it was important to them to keep the peace, and protect their financial interests. Many founding fathers were disturbed by the implications of Shays' rebellion for America's reputation abroad. George Washington himself wrote, Commotion of this sort like snowballs gather strength as they roll. If there is no opposition in the way to divide and crumble them, I am mortified beyond expression that in the moment of our acknowledged independence, we should by our conduct verify the prediction of our transatlantic foe, and render ourselves ridiculous and contemptible in the eyes of all Europe. Why would the country look ridiculous and contemptible? Because the European aristocrats, who were part of the monarchical systems in Europe, had predicted that a constitutional republic could not possibly work. They were convinced it would not have the power to keep down the violent chaos that could result from the discontent of the masses. The Founding Fathers wanted to prove them wrong. Yet here they were, ten years after the Declaration of Independence, helpless to suppress the chaos. Realizing problems like Shays' Rebellion could spring up in any state, the Federalists' claims of the need for a stronger central federal government gained more supporters. Such a central government would have the power and authority to pull together a temporary federal militia from the ranks of any or all of the states to meet military needs of any kind. It could be sent to put down a state uprising like Shays' as well as come against Indian attacks on any part of the United States and repel possible future foreign invasions by European forces. Leaders in the southern states began to realize that such a federal force might even be called upon to help put down any major slave rebellions that might break out. <music> 
By 1787, a convention was called in May in Philadelphia to discuss what to do next. At the time, it was not referred to as the Constitutional Convention, because many, if not most, of the delegates assumed that the purpose of the convention was to discuss and draft improvements to the existing Articles of Confederation. If they had thought ahead of time that the others in attendance were actually planning to push through a whole new system of government, they would not have come. Anti-Federalist Patrick Henry had been gung-ho in 1774 to support the entry of the colonies into the Revolutionary War, as shown in this illustration portraying his Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech to the Virginia Assembly. But 13 years later, he was as adamantly opposed to supporting a new system of government under a new constitution. Right off the bat, the fact that the Constitutional Convention was being held in secret not open to the public, made him angry. Highly skeptical of the closed-lipped proceedings, Henry proclaimed his distrust with the now-famous line, I smell a rat. Although many in attendance at the convention had anti-federalist tendencies, once discussions got underway and the federalists, such as Henry's fellow Virginian James Madison and Alexander Hamilton from New York, laid out their arguments, most of the delegates, though not all, came to agree in general terms that the goal would be a new system of government, not simply a revised version of the Articles of Confederation. By September, they had hammered out this new system and enshrined the details of what was to become the Constitution of the United States. 39 of the 55 delegates signed it on September 17, 1787. But that didn't mean it was the new law of the land. First, it had to be ratified by the ratifying conventions of nine of the 13 states, and it was no easy task getting that ratification. In Virginia, Patrick Henry ranted that Virginia's delegates had been sent to Philadelphia to amend the Articles of Confederation, not to create an entirely new constitution. In fact, there was no need for a new constitution, for as Henry also insisted, there was no crisis, at least not in Virginia. Disorders have arisen in other parts of America, but here, sir, no dangers, no insurrection or tumult has happened. Everything has been calm and tranquil. If the Constitution was ratified, Henry exclaimed, I conceive the Republic to be in extreme danger. If a wrong step be now made, the Republic may be lost forever. Henry was eloquent, but not eloquent enough. In the end, the Virginia Convention voted 89 to 79 to ratify the Constitution, with the stipulation that the Federal Convention would promptly take up discussing and voting on some amendments that would fix some complaints they had about parts of its contents. Ratification was just as contentious in Massachusetts. The Massachusetts Convention was angry and rowdy, including erupting into a fist fight between Federalist Delegate Francis Dana and Anti-Federalist Elbridge Gerry when Gerry was prevented from speaking. The impasse was only broken when Revolutionary War heroes and leading anti-federalists Samuel Adams and John Hancock agreed to ratification, but like Virginia, only on the condition that the Federal Constitutional Convention also accept proposals for amendments. As soon as the Constitution was ratified by at least nine states, it would replace the government that had existed under the Articles of Confederation, but it would only legally apply to those states that ratified it. Those who postponed ratification would only be included if and when they later completed ratification. The nine-state goal was reached in June 1788. So on September 13, 1788, the Articles of Confederation Congress certified the new Constitution and directed the new government to meet in New York City on the first Wednesday in March the following year. On March 4, 1789, the new constitutional government came into force with 11 of the 13 states participating. Later that year, North Carolina finally agreed, and by May 1790, Rhode Island finally joined also. Congressional meetings began in the federal building in New York, and as seen in this illustration, George Washington was inaugurated as president there on April 30th. But several of the states had only agreed to ratify on the condition that amendments to the Constitution would be promptly considered. The strongest demands were for a package of amendments that would state clearly a list of rights guaranteed to the citizens of the new country. <music> 
After Virginia had ratified the Constitution, James Madison ran for a Virginia seat in the new Federal House of Representatives. He succeeded in winning the election only by promising voters that he would propose the appropriate amendments that were being urged by people from many states. True to his promise, Madison was the key figure in putting together the 12 amendments that became the Bill of Rights. Madison submitted the 12 to Congress in their final form on June 8, 1789. Copies were sent out to the states for ratification on September 8, 1789. The process took a while, but on December 15, 1791, 10 of the 12 amendments were ratified by enough states to become the Bill of Rights, an official part of the Constitution. By this time, there were 14 states as Vermont had been admitted to the Union on March 4, 1791. The first proposed amendment about setting the size of the House of Representatives was never ratified by enough states, and the second about pay raises for congressmen wasn't ratified until 1982. And three states, Massachusetts, Georgia, and Connecticut never got around to ratifying the Bill of Rights clear up until 1939. So we have now arrived at our destination, the Bill of Rights. For the purposes of this video series, we can skim past the First Amendment, which enumerates freedom of religion, speech, publication, and assembly, along with a guarantee of being able to petition the government with complaints. Some of the most urgent questions of right now in the United States have to do with content and application of the 18th century's Second Amendment to the context of 21st century American society, which is very, very strange given the fact that it is only one sentence. How can that one sentence, written well over two centuries ago, provide fodder for what amounts to a whole cottage industry of books on the topic? These book covers, shown, are only a small selection of the books available that have the words Second Amendment in the title. There are even books, such as this one, that are written to an audience of school-age children. This one is described on Amazon as a charming children's story that reclaims American values. It is set in a rural hunting family setting with the lad owning his own hunting rifle. It does leave you wondering how it would have been charmingly illustrated and told in an urban setting with a family whose main exposure to gun use is at a target range using AR-15 rifles. Oh, and those books are just samples of the ones that actually have the phrase Second Amendment in the title. If you expand that to books that are obviously about the same topic, discussing U.S. gun rights and gun control issues, the possibilities are almost endless. How have these authors all been able to create explanations for that one sentence Second Amendment? that often span books of two and three hundred pages. Even more poignantly, how can they manage to often totally disagree with each other and come to such wildly differing conclusions? What is it that they can all find to bicker about? Basically, the significance of these three phrases, well-regulated militia, bear arms, and shall not be infringed. The first question is whether the right being addressed in this amendment is specifically about a right to have weapons so that a citizen can effectively participate in a militia. Or can we somehow safely ignore that first half of the sentence and insist that the right is about individuals having a right to have weapons for whatever purpose and wherever they want to have them? The second question is whether this odd term, to bear arms, means to carry or use weapons in any way? Or is it specifically about using weapons in a military setting? And if one should happen to decide that it actually refers to carrying and using weapons outside of a military setting, perhaps for hunting or target shooting for recreation or for personal self-defense, does shall not be infringed mean that the government is forbidden from imposing any restrictions on the type of weapons or the places in which they may be carried around or used. <music>
And does it mean the government is forbidden from imposing any type of regulation on such use, such as requiring the weapon to be registered or requiring the user to have a license for concealed carry issued by the government? In other words, just how narrow are we to understand the word infringed? What did the original author of the amendment mean in his own mind when he wrote it? What did the representatives who made the decision about the inclusion of this amendment in the final Bill of Rights believe that it meant? And after it was declared the law of the land, part of the Constitution, how did the citizens, the law enforcement officials, and the courts apply this statement to everyday life? The problem we have in deciding what Madison meant by it, and what his associates in the 1780s also assumed was meant by it, is that Madison didn't bother to add any footnotes to it, nor can we find anywhere else in his writings where he elaborated on it. Although we do have written records of some of his thoughts on parts of the Bill of Rights, including this actual handwritten outline that he used when giving a speech introducing that document, it seems that none of them have anything to do with this particular single sentence in that Bill of Rights. We are left, just like all the other authors of all those books, trying to rummage around in other writings of the colonial time period by other authors to see what they might have had to say about it. We're left sorting through the events and circumstances of the time, such as the Shays' Rebellion, to see how they might have obviously affected what the author was thinking. And we are left inspecting the records of history since that time to see how our ancestors dealt with gun rights and gun control issues in the various eras of the 19th and early 20th century. To be totally clear on this, the current position of the NRA and many other groups like it, such as those shown here, regarding the amendment is generally some version of the following four points. They claim to be able to establish all four of these points by examination of the Second Amendment. Point one. The primary original goal of the Second Amendment was to declare that all people, well, all free white adult males, in America had an absolute right to use a weapon in personal defense. Obviously, enslaved black men did not have such a right. Slave laws in some states were such that a black male who tried to defend himself against a violent beating by an owner or overseer was just subject to more beating. If any slave resist his master, correcting such slave, and shall happen to be killed in such correction, the master shall be free of all punishment, as if such accident never happened. And if he did try to defend himself and injured or killed his tormentor, he would be subject to capital punishment himself. Modern gun rights proponents also insist the amendment's primary goal included that all free white males had a right to use weapons in the defense of their families. Obviously, enslaved black men did not have this right. They had no rights at all regarding their families, which could be taken away from them at any moment and sold. In fact, if one injured or killed a white man trying to defend his wife against sexual or physical abuse by such a man, he could also be subject to death. But back to the modern position of the NRA. An important part of their understanding of the amendment includes their insistence that, point three, the term to bear arms did not imply serve in the military in the 18th and early 19th century. It was just a general term that meant to carry and use. So the fellow in this 1845 illustration from a Philadelphia fashion publication with the rifle on his shoulder supposedly would have been referred to as bearing arms in a fox hunt. Yes, it turns out that fox hunting was a popular leisure pastime among the emerging gentry class of Philadelphia in the late 1700s and early 1800s. And finally, the modern so-called Second Amendment people are sure of this fourth point. Shall not infringe on the right to have and use weapons was intended to mean absolutely no limitations were allowed to be put on the right, any free white male could have as many and as many kinds of weapons as he wanted, he could carry these weapons openly or concealed any place he wanted to, and he could not be required to register such weapons or to obtain a license to own or use such weapons. In other words, they insist that shall not infringe was an unlimited command. It was also not to be affected in any way in relation to change circumstances in the nation.
Modern weapons are exponentially more powerful than 18th century weapons, and some are capable of equipping any single person, including a child, to kill large numbers of people extremely quickly and efficiently in a way that the Founding Fathers would likely not have even been able to fathom was possible. But gun control opponents typically insist these factors are irrelevant. It is their firm conviction that the words shall not infringe do not allow for any limitations. Many exponents of modern gun rights have somehow been able to sift all of this dogmatic meaning out of the single sentence in the Second Amendment. So let's examine some aspects of history that may be relevant to these conclusions. It will be helpful first to clarify what are arms. A weapon, arm, or armament is any device that can be used with intent to inflict damage or harm. Although you can use almost anything from rocks to frying pans as weapons or arms, it specifically refers to objects designed specifically for the purpose. In colonial times, the primary arms an individual would have used included muskets, rifles, pistols and swords, mostly carried by army and militia officers, and fighting knives, such as the type later called a Bowie knife after the Jim Bowie who used this type, and another, shown below the Bowie knife, called the Arkansas toothpick. When the Anti-Federalists were debating the Federalists in the state ratification conventions, they insisted that there were a number of important rights that were not necessarily self-evident. Just to be sure that everyone could agree what these rights were, they wanted them written down in a Bill of Rights to be added to the Constitution. They did not think that every single right that all people obviously had needed to be included, just those that might later be challenged. So, do we have any reason to think that they were uncertain about whether everyone agreed that people had a right to defend themselves from harm by others? I have been unable to find any evidence at all that would indicate that either in America or Europe, or indeed almost anywhere else in the world, there were governments who forbade their people from defending themselves. Well, except once again in America and other slaveholding nations, unfortunately there really were laws in some places that forbade some humans from defending themselves. It would seem logical that these colonial folks wouldn't be worried about whether or not they individually had a right to own a gun, since the colonies all had a requirement that every man had to buy and keep one ready at all times. By the way, because the guns at the time all required loose gunpowder to work, it was necessary to have a supply of not just musket balls or rifle bullets, but of gunpowder. Except you see, a big supply of loose gunpowder was a very dangerous item to keep around the house in a keg. The reality is that most people kept only a small amount, perhaps in a powder horn, at home. By the early 1700s, everyone's individual major supply of gunpowder, often along with their muskets or rifles also, was stored for them in a central warehouse called a public magazine, like this one shown at Colonial Williamsburg, built in 1715. It is 60 feet tall and over 30 feet around, with walls two feet thick. This practice got its start in Virginia after a horrific incident in April 1645. The house of a colonist named John Johnson caught on fire. Johnson had 17 barrels of gunpowder stored at the property. It is said that the resulting explosion, quote, shook the houses in Boston and Cambridge, so as men thought it had been an earthquake, unquote. Boston is over 500 miles from Williamsburg. So, no, the colonists did not each have an arsenal in their home, no matter what many modern militia types may think. How about that term, bare arms? Was it a common phrase that everyone used to describe just owning and using a weapon and carrying it around anywhere and any time, such as out hunting? Well, there's this, written by the Supreme Court of Tennessee in the early 1800s, barely 50 years after the Bill of Rights was written. Evidently, some Tennessee fellow broke some Tennessee law about carrying some kind of concealed weapon where he wasn't supposed to, and his lawyer must have tried to get him off by calling the court's attention to the state constitution, which said, quote, the free white men of this state have a right to keep and bear arms for their common defense, unquote. The Tennessee court had this 
to say about that. A man in the pursuit of deer, elk, and buffaloes might carry his rifle every day for 40 years, and yet it would never be said of him that he had borne arms. Much less could it be said that a private citizen bears arms because he has a dirk or pistol concealed under his clothes or a spear in his cane. This statement from the Tennessee court made it very clear that it was a common understanding that if someone has borne arms, they have used a weapon as part of military service. And to clarify the meaning with an even earlier document, there's this. The original version of the amendment as passed by the House. Further editing by the Senate ended up with the version that we have now, but notice carefully the implications of this earlier version for understanding the meaning of bare arms. A well-regulated militia, composed of the body of the people, being the best security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, but no one religiously scrupulous of bearing arms shall be compelled to render military service in person. Religiously scrupulous of bearing arms. Let's think this through. If bearing arms doesn't specifically imply using a weapon in the military to shoot at people, why would a religious person, likely a Quaker in Pennsylvania at this time in history, have religious scruples about carrying a hunting rifle? I am sure Quakers were not vegans or vegetarians. The Quakers of Pennsylvania wrote a general letter back to Quakers still in Britain in 1683, bragging about the new land they had come to, bragging about, quote, fowl, fish, and venison are plentiful, and of pork and beef no want, considering that about 2,000 people came into this river last year. Dear friends and brethren, we have no cause to murmur. Our lot is fallen every way in a goodly place, unquote. I'm sure they didn't chase down deer and hint them over the head with a wooden club to get at that venison. As for shall not be infringed, if in fact the amendment means that there should be zero restrictions on weapons that could be privately owned and used, then we would expect those much, much closer to the founding of the country to be acting like that's what they understood. As a matter of fact, some state constitutions from that early period do spell out a specific right for their citizens to own and use weapons for personal protection and hunting. So did they think that these rights were somehow limitless? No, they did not. In the early 1800s, they were particularly concerned about what we now call concealed carry, as seen in that Tennessee decision. Kentucky and Louisiana put in place concealed carry laws in 1813. Like the Tennessee law, the main concern at first was knives, as revolvers hadn't been invented yet. At one point, a Kentucky court reversed the state's ban as being against the state's constitution. So the state proceeded to amend its constitution, specifying clearly that the Kentucky General Assembly was within its rights in the future to regulate or prohibit concealed carry. Georgia and Alabama had similar early laws. The preamble of Georgia's 1837 law began, an act to guard and protect the citizens of this state against the unwarrantable and too prevalent use of deadly weapons. And Alabama's 1839 concealed carry law clarified it was an act to suppress the evil practice of carrying weapons secretly. That was in the first half of the 1800s. How about the second half after the end of the Civil War as settlers and cattlemen and others began spreading west across the prairies? Have you thought because of the proliferation of guns and films about the Old West since the very beginning of the movie industry right up to today, that the place and time really was the Wild West? Have you assumed that most every cowboy and card sharp all across the gun-crazy land of the Western Plains, from the Civil War to the First World War, went around all the time with what one cowboy song by Marty Robbins called a big iron on his hip? Some of them shooting it out regularly in the dusty streets or brawling bars because they lived back at a time when men were real men and knew their Second Amendment rights to brandish and blast their weapons at will. If that's what you've assumed, you might want to think again. What Americans have been exposed to from their childhood Saturday afternoons watching B-Western movies at the neighborhood theater throughout the 1940s and 50s, to the sagas of John Wayne, Clint Eastwood, and all the rest in later years, 
has actually been a myth. Crafted over the years by writers of 19th century dime novels, by directors of cowboy movies and TV shows in the 20th century, and even by songwriters churning out mournful Western songs like Streets of Laredo, where a young cowpoke lays lying, dying after a shootout. Yes, a myth. As one historian writing about that era put it, the truth is many more people have died in Hollywood Westerns than ever died on the real frontier. In the real Dodge City, for instance, there were just five killings in 1878, the most homicidal year. In the most violent year in Deadwood, South Dakota, only four people were killed. As a matter of fact, in the worst year in Tombstone, home of the infamous gunfight at the OK Corral, only five people were killed, including the three killed in that one incident. And by the way, that OK Corral incident was sparked when Sheriff Virgil Earp, his brothers Wyatt and Morgan, and friend Doc Holliday first engaged in confrontation with the men in the battle to chastise them for going against a local ordinance that forbade carrying any kind of guns, either long guns or pistols, in town. The famous gunfight took all of 30 seconds, and the results, the three dead men, likely put a damper on further resistance to the town gun ordinance. The merchants and civic leaders in almost all western towns, as soon as the town began growing, wanted to attract respectable people to move to town, so most enacted stringent gun laws. Such as Dodge City, Kansas, which, as you can see from this photo in 1878, totally forbade any guns within the city limits. Anyone entering such towns were to check their gun at the sheriff's office, or perhaps a designated local hotel or tavern. They would receive a receipt of some kind and use it to retrieve their weapon when they were ready to leave town. As one writer put it who had studied the famous Western outlaws, they were few, inconspicuous, and largely the invention of newspaper correspondents and fiction writers. And as for the supposedly heroic lawmen of the time, the Western Marshal was an unglamorous character who spent his time arresting drunks or rounding up stray dogs and almost never engaging in gun battles. In other words, they were mostly like Sheriff Andy Taylor, not Wyatt Earp. The bottom line is this. There was no federal law regarding firearms until the National Firearms Act of 1934. But those state laws about concealed carry in places like Kentucky and Tennessee mentioned earlier were only the tip of the iceberg of thousands of state and municipal laws enacted throughout the whole country from the early 1800s on that restricted and regulated the possession and use of all kinds of weapons. What kind of laws? In addition to many bans on concealed carry, some jurisdictions banned any kind of firearms possession inside any city, town, or village. Others banned brandishing a weapon in a threatening manner. Some banned weapon accessories like silencers. Others banned pistols or unusual weapons like sawed-off shotguns. Some mandated registration and or taxation on weapons. Others put various kinds of restrictions on hunting. When any of these laws were challenged in the courts as perhaps going against a state constitution, the courts would acknowledge that citizens did have a right to personal self-defense and to use weapons for that defense. But the state had an equally valid right to put in place certain restrictions and regulations for the greater good of the whole community when necessary. At the federal level, it wasn't until the 21st century that a new Supreme Court decided to change the 200-year history of how the government looked at the Second Amendment. To understand the circumstances of how this change came about, we need to go back now and take a further look at the National Rifle Association. As covered in the first episode in this series, the National Rifle Association, the NRA, started out in 1871 with a goal to improve the marksmanship of soldiers and future soldiers. For the next 75 years or so, they spent most of their efforts focused on that goal. They organized marksmanship clubs, sponsored shooting competitions, offered classes in gun safety, and even assisted the U.S. government in developing training programs for the military. Along the way, they expanded to include catering to the interests of hunters and outdoorsmen. It was logical that over the years, starting at its very beginning, right through its first century, most of the leaders in the organization were retired military men. 
And given the two world wars in the first half of the 20th century, it was also logical that the typical NRA member by the 1950s had also been in the military service at some point in his life. Since the main opportunity in civilian life to use a gun for more than just shooting at paper targets was hunting, it's also logical that the typical NRA member, clear up into the 1950s, was involved in sport hunting some of the time. By the early 1970s, the leadership of the organization was still, for the most part, made up of retired military men. This included Maxwell Rich, who became executive vice president of the NRA in 1970. The position of president in the organization is largely ceremonial. The real person in control of most of the organization's efforts is the executive vice president. In the 1960s, there had been some rumbling among some within the NRA leadership of the need to get more involved in politics, to protect any encroachment on the freedom of American citizens to own and use guns, especially after the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert F. Kennedy in 1968. This concern increased with the signing of the Gun Control Act of 1968. The organization's headquarters was located right in Washington, D.C., so it was poised to be able to engage in lobbying efforts. A lobbying branch of the organization dubbed the Institute for Legislative Action, NRAILA, was established in 1975, but there was little enthusiasm for it among the top NRA leadership of the time. That included General Rich, who was part of what was often termed the Old Guard within the NRA. His vision for the organization was similar to that of the original founders. He was convinced it was important for all boys to be taught to shoot a gun and practice gun safety. And it was important that adequate wide open spaces should be preserved in the land for use by hunters. He was an old fashioned man who had no interest in computers or high powered politics. As one writer put it, he thought the NRA should get back to its roots concentrate on Save the Wilderness projects, and shoot them up sporting events. In fact, soon after becoming the top executive in the organization, Rich led plans to sell the NRA building in Washington and move NRA headquarters to Colorado Springs in the wide open spaces of Colorado. And under his leadership, the group purchased 77,000 acres in New Mexico for what they plan to call a National Outdoors Center, not even a shooting center. They did finish those plans for what is now called the Whittington Center. It is a nominally independent operation, not directly under the management of the NRA. That's because they were hoping to get sponsorship for it as a non-profit organization directly from groups such as the Ford Foundation. But when canvassing for such sponsors, they came to realize that the inflammatory reputation of the NRA would make this center unappealing to such foundations. So to this day, it is an independent non-profit, although there is zero chance you wouldn't understand it is primarily focused on shooting these days, and that although it isn't directly funded by or under control of the NRA, it is still closely, very closely associated with it. There are plenty of shooting opportunities for people of all ages at Whittington. Although you can go hiking and camping and take pretty pictures of scenery and wildlife there, the main attraction is no doubt the 15 shooting ranges, the regular shooting competitions, and the trophy animals you can hunt. Maxwell Rich yearned for the NRA's past, but not everyone shared his enthusiasm for the good old days. Several members of his staff made plans to thwart the plans of Rich and the rest of the old guard. As one of the dissidents said later of Rich, he was trying to roll back the clock when the rest of the world was going modern. The rebel staffers held secret meetings, organizing what they called the Federation. When they became bolder and began speaking openly of their resistance, the old guard took decisive steps to put an end to it. At four o'clock in the afternoon of November 8, 1976, a quarter of the 300-person headquarters staff received termination notices. 74 people in all were forced out. The head of the newly minted Institute for Legislative Action was a man named Harlan Carter. He had secretly been part of the Federation. He wasn't fired that day, but most of those who were were his friends and associates in the organization. In fact, the whole staff of the ILA was fired. Carter resigned in protest and began plotting revenge. Born near Fort Worth, Texas in 1913, Harlan Carter was a trained lawyer and a nationally recognized competitive marksman holding dozens of both national and world shooting records. 
He led the Border Patrol from 1950 through 1957. In 1954, he spearheaded what was recognized as the biggest drive against illegal aliens in history, rounding up and deporting over a million Mexicans in the one year, an unknown number of them actually American citizens or legal immigrants. It was called, in those politically incorrect times, Operation Wetback. After his stint in the Border Patrol, he ended up heading the southwestern region of the Immigration and Naturalization Service from 1961 through 1970. But in the midst of all this activity, Harlan Carter also made time to become part of the NRA and to rise in its ranks. He joined the NRA around 1929 as a teenager. By 1951, he was a member of the NRA Board of Directors and began a quick climb toward the top. He was vice president between 1963 and 1965 and president from 1965 to 1967. After that, he was honored with a lifetime position on the NRA Executive Council. And by 1975, he was working at the headquarters in Washington, D.C. as head of the new Institute for Legislative Action. And through it all, Harlan Carter believed that the NRA needed an extreme makeover from a mild-mannered group of sportsmen to a militant group of gun toters ready to defend to the death the right to tote any type of weapon they wanted, anytime, anywhere, because the Constitution said they have a right to. One of Carter's most zealous associates in NRA circles was Neil Knox, a publisher of popular gun magazines out of Prescott, Arizona. Raised in Texas, Knox attended Abilene Christian University. He married a classmate who kept a rifle in her dorm room closet and shared his passion for hunting. His other passion was railing against gun control and even occasionally accusing the NRA of being too willing to compromise on gun rights. By 1977, he was more and more irritated with the NRA leadership, accusing them of softening their lobbying efforts regarding gun control in order to maximize corporate donations for their proposed recreation center in New Mexico. Knox was frustrated that they were choosing to put the emphasis on general outdoor sports and even conservation projects rather than on fearlessly attacking any and all gun control efforts by government. Knox was utterly convinced that the Second Amendment was absolute and aimed at guaranteeing without any hindrance the right of civilians to own any kind of weapons and use them for any purpose, including, in particular, personal defense. His biggest concern was any attempt at registering guns, which he believed would inevitably lead to the rise of a dictatorship in America that would confiscate all weapons and subdue the citizenry. Knox was a complete believer in a tactic of absolutely no compromise. As he famously declared, quote, Compromise means giving up more than the other side is big enough to take. And if and when they have the muscle, they'll be back for more, regardless of what has been given up in an attempt to appear reasonable. You can't make a cur dog stay away from your back door by throwing an occasional bone at him. At one point in the mid-1990s, Knox even suggested that assassinations of JFK and Martin Luther King might have been staged to build support for gun control. After the NRA leadership thought that they had successfully purged the headquarters staff of men like Knox in 1976, Harlan Carter, Neil Knox, and others secretly set about making plans to pull an unexpected coup and a purge of their own at the next annual meeting of the organization to begin on May 21, 1977 in Cincinnati. Through gun magazine articles and thousands of letters and phone calls to individuals on various gun enthusiast mailing lists, the dissident group gathered support for their agenda. A month before the NRA May meeting, the ringleaders met in person in San Antonio, where they finalized plans for what was to be an NRA member revolution. Almost 225,000 of the people at the time who were card-carrying members of the NRA were what were known as life members. They paid $200 a year membership dues instead of the usual $15 or so, which gave them voting rights at the annual meeting. And thus, under the bylaws, they held the ultimate power in the NRA. In the past, it appeared few had taken advantage of this power, but the ringleaders of the Federation intended to change that. They had discovered that those members who assembled at the annual meeting held the ultimate power in the decision-making done there. If they chose to wield it, 
anyone at the meeting could introduce a motion directly from the floor, rather than just the board of directors and other organizational leaders formally sitting on the stage. The plan was to introduce from the floor a slate of bylaw changes that could redirect the course of the NRA and let the members decide whether to adopt them or not. The publicity efforts of the Federation Group paid off and over 1,000 enthusiastic supporters showed up in Cincinnati for the annual meeting on May 21st. The old guard men on the stage on that Saturday started out as they always had, working through a formal meeting agenda they had crafted on their own, likely expecting the delegates in the audience to just rubber stamp what they offered as motions. I'm guessing they didn't notice the men scattered throughout the convention hall wearing orange hunting caps and carrying walkie-talkies who were working the room, rallying the troops. I've read that what happened next is now referred back to as the Revolt at Cincinnati. I think maybe a more appropriate nickname might be the Gunfight at the Cincinnati Corral. At some point later in the day, to the shock of the men on the stage, Neil Knox stood up from the audience as spokesman for the rebel group and used the NRA's own parliamentary rules to abruptly interrupt the agenda. He then offered motion after motion, calling for amendments to the NRA Constitution. And in reply, voices of, I second the motion, rang out. And the earthquake began. Before the old guard could process what was going on, the group took control of the meeting, calling for vote after vote, passing many new amendments to the bylaws. This went on hour after hour until four o'clock in the morning. By the end, the rebels had succeeded in voting to restructure the board elections. Board candidates could be nominated by petition from the members, and members could recall officers of the organization. The executive vice president would be directly elected by the membership. They voted for amendments recommitting the NRA to focusing on the Second Amendment and fighting gun control and restored the lobbying efforts of the Institute for Legislative Action. Before it was all over, they restructured the organization's management, fired key officials, and in a final swooping move, tossed aside Executive Vice President Maxwell Rich and elected a brand new Executive Vice President. Harlan Carter, who thundered from the stage, beginning in this place and at this hour, this period in NRA history, is finished. Carter wasted no time in taking the reins and turning the NRA sharply onto a new path. He promptly canceled the planned move of the national headquarters to Colorado Springs. Speaking of Washington, D.C., he declared, this is where the action is. To emphasize the new direction the NRA was taking, he changed the organization's motto on its D.C. headquarters building. No longer would it read that the NRA was dedicated to firearm safety education, marksmanship training, and shooting for recreation. Instead, engraved in big letters would be the words from the Second Amendment, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Of course, conveniently edited out of the quote were the introductory words about a well-trained militia. As Carter took control, he vowed that the NRA would become so strong and so dedicated that no politician in America mindful of his political career, would want to challenge our legitimate goals. Seven months after the Cincinnati coup, Neil Knox became the NRA's chief lobbyist and served for the next four years as the executive director of the Institute for Legislative Action. Later, he became a member of the NRA Board of Directors. By 1985, when Carter retired, the NRA had surged from 1 million members in 1977 to 3 million members, with 3,000 new members joining weekly. The NRA members wanted and proved they were willing to fund an NRA that would defend the Second Amendment. The New York Times pronounced it the most persistent and resourceful of all single-issue groups. One author writing on the history of the NRA has noted, To the NRA faithful... Harlan Carter is Moses, George Washington, and John Wayne rolled into one. And former NRA President Sandy Froman wrote, Harlan Carter's vision for the NRA 
was as important as George Washington's was for America. Carter was known for his uncompromising and often extreme views on gun rights. Testifying before a Senate committee at one point, he was asked if he would allow convicted felons, the mentally incompetent, and drug addicts to own guns, rather than require background screening for all gun purchases. He replied that he would, calling it a price we pay for freedom. Shortly after the 77 earthquake, Neil Knox hired a man named Wayne LaPierre to work for the NRA's lobbying arm. By 1986, LaPierre was head of lobbying, and by 1991, he had moved up the ladder to claim the prize of the top NRA position, executive vice president, a position he holds to this day. His rhetoric has been as fiery as Carter's ever was, and his positions perhaps even more extreme at times. In 1995, he sent out an NRA fundraising letter in which he referred to federal agents as jackbooted thugs. Former President George H.W. Bush resigned from the group in protest of that letter. After the Cincinnati coup of 1977, the new NRA quickly dove into politics with gusto. The 1972 Republican platform had supported gun control with a focus on restricting the sale of cheap handguns. But turning on a dime, the 1980 GOP platform proclaimed, we believe the right of citizens to keep and bear arms must be preserved. Accordingly, we oppose federal registration of firearms. That year, the NRA gave Reagan its first ever presidential endorsement. The NRA's crusade was all about establishing that the Second Amendment wasn't about militias at all. It was about ensuring that there was absolutely no interference from government in the freedom of every American to buy and use freely any type of weapon and any number of weapons he wished, and the organization knew that it needed to do four required things to accomplish this goal. Number one, it needed to promote its point of view to the legislators of America on the local, state, and national level and gain their assistance in passing laws to curb any government interference in gun rights, including forbidding required registration of weapons. Number two, it needed to promote its point of view both to its own membership and the wider U.S. public because they were the ones who would vote in the necessary legislators who would be willing to pass the necessary laws and avoid passing any gun control measures. Number three, it needed to help ensure that the executive branch of the government, and the president in particular, came around to its point of view, because the president was the one who could see to it that the final requirement was met. Number four, it needed a Supreme Court that agreed with its point of view and would overturn all the previous decisions about the Second Amendment of all previous courts for the past 200 years. This absolutely required a conservative Republican president who would appoint conservative judges. The power of the NRA is a result of its absolute, unwavering, focused dedication to these four points. It doesn't get sidetracked by other issues, and as the years have gone by, it has become less and less inclined to compromise in any way with anyone to get what it wants. It neither cooperates nor compromises, it dogmatically demands and bullies. The concerted effort toward this ultimate approach began slowly, and it got its first toehold through what are called law reviews. Until looking into this topic, I was unaware of exactly what a law review was and how it functioned. Here's what I found out. One way to establish how legal opinions have changed over the history of the country is to examine the collection over decades and centuries of what are called law review articles. What is a law review? A law review is the technical term for a law journal that focuses on legal issues. They are usually published by an organization of students at a law school at a university or college. Law reviews publish lengthy articles which are comprehensive treatments of law subjects. Long articles are generally written by law professors, judges, or practicing lawyers. Shorter articles are written by law students. Some law reviews specialize in topics like civil rights and civil liberties, 
international law, environmental law, or human rights. But here is the important point for this discussion. Law reviews are scholarly publications, but unlike many similar scholarly publications in fields such as science, articles published in law reviews are not subject to peer review. In other words, no matter how solid the research and reasoning, or how questionable or sloppy some of it may be, it is presented in the law journal without any comment by other law scholars. There are over 200 current or former law reviews or law journals in the United States, and there are a number of indexes that include large collections of articles from these law reviews, especially now in the age of the Internet. The first such index was created in 1888, and you are thus able, with some effort, to search almost every article ever published in the American Law Reviews from 1888 on. I tell you all this to make a point. Historically, law review articles have been influential in the development of the laws of our land. They have been frequently cited as persuasive authority by the courts in the United States. The articles are not legal documents. They are only information and opinion by their individual authors about a narrow topic they have researched. So they have no real authority, but that hasn't stopped them from having an outsized influence on court decisions over the years, right up to today. And thus it is instructive to learn how the topic of the application of the Second Amendment has been treated by law review articles over the years. What I found out is that from 1888, when law review articles were first indexed, through 1959, a period of over 70 years, every single one on the Second Amendment concluded it did not guarantee an individual right to a gun. The first such law review to take the opposite of position was written by a law school student in 1960. The article began by citing an article in the NRA's American Rifleman magazine. And the student author argued that the amendment enforced what he referred to as a right of revolution. In fact, he even claimed that the southern states were claiming this right when they engaged in the war between the states. At first, only a few law review articles echoed the student writer's view. But starting in the late 1970s, a growing squad of attorneys and professors began to churn out piles of articles supporting this new approach to the Second Amendment that were printed in law reviews. And where did these attorneys and professors get the impetus for their writing, the money to pay for the time and expense of doing the work? As one author put it, funds, much of them from the NRA, flowed freely. An essay contest, grants to write book reviews, the creation of a group called the Academics for the Second Amendment, all followed. In 2003, the NRA Foundation donated $1 million to the conservative George Mason University Law School to endow what was named the Patrick Henry Professorship in Constitutional Law and the Second Amendment. As you may remember from our little refresher course in colonial history, George Mason was one of the three Virginia delegates to the Constitutional Convention who refused to sign the Constitution an anti-federalist who had a major role in the writing of the Virginia Constitution and Virginia Bill of Rights, he insisted that the new federal constitution would not be acceptable without such a Bill of Rights. All this money funneled to organizations and authors was ultimately aimed at overturning the historical view of the Second Amendment, at proving that a colossal constitutional mistake had been made and the situation needed to be rectified. As their efforts took hold, shifts in government began. In 1981, Ronald Reagan's presidency began and the Republicans took control of the U.S. Senate for the first time in 24 years. Utah Senator Orrin Hatch became chair of a key Judiciary Committee panel. In this capacity, he commissioned a study on the right to keep and bear arms. Surprise, surprise. The report from the committee soon announced what the subcommittee on the Constitution uncovered was clear and long lost proof that the Second Amendment to our Constitution was intended as an individual right of the American citizen to keep and carry arms in a peaceful manner for protection of himself, his family, and his freedoms. Hatch got a bit ahead of the curve. 
Other conservatives in Reagan's Justice Department weren't quite ready to take the deep dive yet. They didn't plan any changes related to the Second Amendment once in power. But in time, the NRA's power to elect presidents won over the executive branch. In 2000, gun activists strongly backed Governor George W. Bush of Texas. After the election, Bush's new Attorney General, John Ashcroft, issued a new policy statement that was read aloud at the NRA's 2001 convention. The text and original intent of the Second Amendment clearly protect the right of individuals to keep and bear firearms. The national media got on board talking about the issues. In 1993, the New York Times mentioned gun control 388 times and the Second Amendment only 16. By 2008, overall mentions of the issue dropped to 160, but the Second Amendment was mentioned 59 times. All of this publicity in the media, along with all the Second Amendment bumper stickers, started working its magic on the needed shift in public opinion. In 1959, according to a Gallup poll, 60% of Americans favored banning handguns. That dropped to 41% by 1975 and 24% in 2012. And then there was this. By early 2008, according to Gallup, 73% of Americans believed the Second Amendment guaranteed the rights of Americans to own guns outside the militia. The NRA has succeeded in accomplishing much of its first three goals. The legislature was now full of pro-NRA position congressmen, the public was persuaded about the real original meaning of the Second Amendment, and the executive branch was on board. All that was left was to turn the Supreme Court. As one writer put it, in the end, it was neither the NRA nor the Bush administration that pressed the Supreme Court to reverse its centuries-old approach, but a small group of libertarian lawyers who believed other gun advocates were too timid. They targeted a gun law passed by the local government in Washington, D.C. in 1976, perhaps the nation's strictest, that barred individuals from keeping a loaded handgun at home without a trigger lock. They established a test case regarding a man named Heller, and it worked its way through the court system. And thus we arrive at a 2008 case brought before the Supreme Court titled District of Columbia v. Heller. As author Robert Perry has put it, the argument presented in District of Columbia v. Heller showed just how far the gun rights crusade had come. Nearly all the questions focused on arcane matters of colonial history. Few dealt with preventing gun violence, social science findings, or the effectiveness of today's gun laws, the kinds of things judges might once have considered. On June 26, 2008, the Supreme Court ruled five to four that the Second Amendment guarantees a right to own a weapon in common use to protect hearth and home. Scalia wrote the opinion, which he later called the vindication of his judicial philosophy. After the Heller decision, there was no stopping the NRA. It was all full steam ahead. Author Perry summed it up succinctly. As gun rights activists struck down the gun regulations in Congress and in state houses across the nation, their dominant argument was that the Second Amendment offered no leeway for restrictions on gun ownership. It's what the framers wanted. So pretty much any unstable person could load up with a vast killing capacity and slouch off to a bar, a workplace, a church, or a school, even an elementary school, and treat fellow Americans as targets in a violent video game, somehow the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness was overtaken by the right to own an AR-15 with a 30 or 100 bullet magazine. In the next installment of Straight Shootin' Info, we will track the continuing rise of the NRA and the gun rights movement in general on into the 21st century. We will examine the modern battle lines that have been drawn in our increasingly divided society and see if we can find any common ground that could help heal that divide. Mm -hmm.